Greetings, Hyde Park Press. False start. Offense. Hyde Park Presbyterian Church. Five yard penalty. False start. False start indeed. Um, I bring to you some news that I know a lot of you aren't going to like, and that is that we are delaying uh, the reopening of the sanctuary for another couple of weeks. Um, the session met on the 23rd of June and decided that uh, it's better to hold off and wait for some of the uh, COVID numbers to go down before opening up the sanctuary for a live worship. Um, all the things that we have been doing, those things continue. The, the video services, the uh, Sunday morning connect class, as well as the, the morning jam and the, the, the kids church, all those things continue. But I've been thinking that a lot of you, like myself, are pretty frustrated with the fact that we are starting to miss out on that connectivity and we're missing each other quite a bit. And I was thinking, how did the early church do this? This is not the first time the church has ever faced you know, a pandemic. Back then they called it a plague. And the way that the church started in the very beginning was through small groups. And because we don't know how much longer it's gonna be until things go back to normal per se, we're gonna start launching into doing some small groups. Small groups that maybe meet at people's houses or meet if they have a, you know, a backyard patio space or we continue to meet via Zoom. But it's gonna take you all helping me to be the church, to be in small groups, to maybe lead some small groups. And I'm gonna need your help to help make that happen. And when we do small groups as a church, everybody wins. Everybody gets an opportunity to learn and to grow their faith a little bit more. And so this is actually an opportunity for us to grow our faith together. And so if you're interested in being in a small group, uh, talk to Linda at the office, give us a call at 813-253-0069 and, and talk to the office or send an email to the church. We're going to get through this. It's just gonna be taking a lot longer than a lot of us realized, but uh, we are always better together. And as we start some of these small group initiatives and continue to worship online, we're going to continue to grow our faith and to learn and grow. I want to thank all of y'all for your patience and your understanding. Know that I want everybody uh, worshiping together as soon as we can, but unfortunately it's just going to be a little bit longer. Thanks so much. And now, before the service gets started, we have a minute for mission. So take a look at this. Hi, my name is Noelle Miller and I'm Thornwell's newest family specialist for the Building Families program. So a little bit about me, I graduated from Trinity College of Florida with my undergraduate degree in clinical counseling and in Bible theology. And then I received my master's degree from Liberty University in marriage and family therapy. So I'm very, very passionate about creating strong families and my ultimate desire is to see children and teens grow up to become healthy adults. Uh, so a little bit about Thornwell, uh, we provide a variety of services to serve families and we do that through workshops, through nurture groups and most notably our in-home services. So our goal is to improve the child's behavior, reduce parental stress and we do that by coming into the home. We have a six phase program that lasts about 12 to 15 weeks and we work with the family to improve family functioning and we work around their schedule so that it's tailored to their needs. So I'm very, very excited to join Hyde Park Presbyterian through Thornwell to serve families in your community. And I hope that I have the opportunity to get to know each and every one of you a bit better. Good morning, it is uh, June 28th and we are continuing our sermon series on new name, new game. Uh, hopefully you're doing well, gather around and uh, enjoy the music pause for some time of prayer, and hear the word proclaimed. Enjoy.
This is the part of the service where I guide us through a time of prayer. So no peeking today and let us go to God in prayer following this, this Acts prayer model of adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and, and supplication. Let us go to God in prayer. We praise you, God, and we glorify your name. For you are the God who created all things, the heavens and the earth, and you have called us by name. You are an amazing God that uh, you know all the creatures 
you know all the hairs on our head, which means you have to count them every day. You're a God who created all these things but wants to get to know us intimately. And you are worthy of our praise and adoration. And so we first lift you up in glory. And now we shift to a, a prayer of, of confession. Gracious God, we know that we continue to, uh, to stumble and we continue to fall short of what you've called us to be. We think about this week and the places where we have fallen short and we lay it before you for you are a God that, that hears our confession. Perhaps this week we have not seen you as, as Lord, but we see you as the world sees you, as perhaps just this good teacher or a prophet. We confess that like Peter, we have maybe denied you or we have turned away from what you have taught us and who you've called us to be. And we confess and we ask your forgiveness in this time. We shift to a prayer now of thanksgiving. We thank you that you forgive us, you rename us, you make us new. You put us on right paths. You direct us. We thank you for the people that you've put in our lives who encourage us, inspire us. We thank you, Lord, that iron sharpens iron, that sometimes you even put folks into our lives that help to shape us into the new creation that you've called us to be, and we thank you. Gracious God, we now shift to a prayer of supplication. We pray, Lord, that you reveal to us your plan, and your power, and you teach us, Lord. Teach us as, Lord, help us to be the little rocks. Help us to be living stones as your church during these challenging times. We lift up the prayer requests for all the folks in the hospital, Lord, We lift up cancer patients today, Lord. We pray for healing. We pray for inspiration for the radical new treatments that are going to solve the health crisis that we are facing. We lift up first responders. Gracious God, I continue to lift up the brave service men and women who are away from their families during these challenging times. We pray for peacemakers. We pray for their loved ones who pray for them and worry for them. Bring them home. Keep them safe. Gracious God, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Linda Waters, and today our scripture comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. Please join your hearts and minds with me in prayer. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so as to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our message this week comes from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 19. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, 
You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Welcome to week three of our New Name, New Game sermon series. Today we are talking about Simon who becomes Peter. And this is found in, in Matthew 16, 13 through 19. And I want to begin by taking us to a place that the scripture tells us that when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi is where he is teaching this lesson. And I love that we get these names, and I, I always give thanks for the, the worship leaders that have to look at some of these names and make sure they say them right and make sure that the names are right. But it's a reminder that Scripture is not a fairy tale. We're not talking about once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away, that these are real places in real times. And so I want to unpack really quick for you this region and this place the Caesarea Philippi area. It was a hub during ancient times um, for what was called Baal worship. So those of you who remember your Old Testament, there's a guy named, a prophet named Elijah. And one day he kind of called for a showdown between our God, Elijah's God, and the prophets of Baal. And it's this great showdown scene where he says, all right, here's the deal. We're going to pour water all over all this wood, and you're going to get all of this wood, and we're going to pray to our gods, and we're going to see who brings fire. And the people that worship Baal, they just go completely you know, over the top, and they're, and they're cutting themselves, and they're doing everything they can to try and make their God show up. But Elijah's God is the one who shows up. And wins the showdown and causes fire on this, on this huge pile of really wet wood with water all over it. And so those of you who remember that story, this is kind of the backdrop, if you will, of where Caesarea Philippi is. It's, it's kind of where some of this Baal worship kind of finds its, its roots. Uh, today the town is called Banis and it's derived from Panis. And on the hillside, there was this, this kind of cave or said to be the, the birthplace of the Greek god Pan, the god of, of nature. And so there was on this hillside a huge marble temple, and Herod the Great had built, you know, this huge, you know, temple to honor, you know, Caesar. And then when Augustus, you know, Caesar gave him the area, he continued to pour, you know, more praise on top of this area and why it's named you know, Caesarea Philippi, but I, for the purpose of this story, I almost want you to think that the backdrop of Caesarea Philippi, it's short and sweet, it's Paganville. Nothing good has come out of here that has been redeeming or speaks anything good about the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus, the God that we follow, that this was in fact, the backdrop was kind of this anything goes kind of den of iniquity this kind of sense where God is kind of mocked. And that's the, that's the backdrop that we find ourselves in this kind of very pagan rich area that this is a spot where Simon kind of makes this confession, this profession to Jesus, where Jesus is in this place where there's all these other gods and all these other temples and all these things. And he asks a question of his followers and he says, who do people say the Son of Man is. He's kind of saying, who do people say that I am? And Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? that in the, the point of this journey that Jesus has kind of taken the temperature of his followers and kind of getting a little bit of what I'd call, what's the word on the street? You guys have been watching me do some of these things. You've seen me heal people. You've seen me do some miracles. What, what is the, the word on the street as to who I am? And also remember, he's saying this in the backdrop of what people in their other gods have kind of thought of their gods and what they are and what they can do. And in the middle of that, this is where Jesus is kind of asking this question. And let's talk about who do they say, but what do you say? What do you say that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is a breakthrough moment for the entire rest of Scripture, if you will. If you talk about a fulcrum, which is how you use leverage to move things around, that this point right here is the fulcrum of the gospel. This is a breakthrough theological turning point. At least for that moment, the disciples, or one of the disciples, gets the trivia question right. The Messiah. Bingo. You guessed it. You hit the nail right on the head, Peter. You got it. Simon Peter, you got it. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for it was not revealed to you by men, but by my Father in heaven. Yes, Simon Peter got the answer right, but you see, this means that Simon received this through what is called revelation. That it, God is at work in the things that we see and the things that we come to understand. That it's revealed to Simon something so important. That this breakthrough doesn't kind of happen just because. It didn't happen because what we don't know is that Simon has been pulling some kind of, you know, all-nighter for a final. This, who's Jesus? That you know, Simon was by far mean, by no means was he the smartest of the disciples. He wasn't the brightest bulb in the box. But instead, it happened by revelation. That God was at work and kind of showed Simon, this is what's going on. Flesh and blood aren't going to get this. God is going to kind of pull the curtain aside for Simon for just that moment. Who do you see him to be? This kind of brings about, there's kind of regular revelation. You kind of learn about nature by watching. You learn about the migratory habits of birds, and you learn about the, the growing cycle of plants by ob kind of observing the sciences. But if you want to kind of key in on the things of God, you need it to be revealed to you by God. And then that's kind of what happens. This is what Jesus is not only explaining to what just happened to Simon Peter, but to everybody else that's watching. It wasn't because, you know, you're the smartest guy, Simon. It's because God just gave you the key to unlock the door. And congratulations, you unlocked it and you saw it. He gives him a new name. He says that, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. You know, unlike our buddy Abram, who becomes Abraham, who goes through this long journey, Peter gets it right there on the spot. He says, Peter, you are the rock, and on you I am going to build my church. You're going to be the, the pillar that all these other pieces kind of stand on. And I'm going to build my church around this revelation. Once again, he becomes Peter. He gets his new name right there after he finally kind of saw what he needed to see, what God put in his heart to say, this is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, and you're the one who's going to tell everybody else that story. Christ is the church, and Peter was the first to point to Christ and say, you're the Messiah. And that's the rock that the church is built on. Jesus renames him Peter to draw his emphasis to him and says, hey, I'm going to build my church on this key revelation. Not what the world says I am. Not what the people think that I am is this good guy or this good prophet or this good knower of the law, but no. 
It's the promise that I am the, the Messiah. I'm the one who is here that the Old Testament said was going to happen, that's going to paint this amazing picture of a great future that you just caught a glimpse of right there, Peter. And you are the rock. But he doesn't stop right there. You're the rock on which I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosened in heaven. You see, the keys, there's a connection between Peter's revelation that he is the Messiah with the keys. There's kind of a lock and a key. That it is this revelation that Jesus is the Messiah and it becomes the key that opens the kingdom of heaven. That Peter's been given the combination to the lock so he can give it to others and opening the kingdom for them. That that's kind of at the core of this amazing aha moment. And he's like, this is the, the cornerstone that the church is built on, that I am the Messiah and that you figured it out. And your job, Peter, as the rock, is to help other people to understand what you have just been given. What has been revealed to you is kind of your job going forward as the rock is to show other people the doorway, to get into heaven, to unlock that, to get them in to heaven. And why is this all so very important? Why does this matter? Well, first and foremost, because all believers, anybody who puts their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, well, guess what? That makes all of us Peter. It's Peter's confessional capacity. It is him understanding who Jesus is and all of us understanding who Jesus is and our belief and our faith in him that becomes the foundation for the church. Week after week, I talk about your storyteller opportunity, your opportunity to tell the story as your own Peter moment of who Jesus Christ is for you and what it means to you and what has been revealed to you about the kingdom of heaven is part of your storyteller moment, which makes you the living stones, that we are all the rocks that become the church. We've all been given the gift of revelation to know who Jesus is. And so our job is to be Peter's, to point to the cross, to point to Christ, to say this is who he is and this is why it matters. The world wants to tell you who Jesus is. Just like then, just like in the middle of Caesarea Philippi, in the middle of Paganville, the world wants to tell you who Jesus is. And it's not that he's the Messiah. That the world wants to tell you that he was maybe this good guy who knew the law and who told us how to be good people and kind of pat you on the head, but to say that he isn't real, that he isn't the Messiah, he isn't the one who fulfills the Old Testament promise for the rest of us. But instead, you have your very own confessional moment like Peter. That you are a part of something. That you are part of these stones that are the church. All of us are the different rocks that become the church. And you are a part of something. And this journey of Simon to Peter is this important thing to remember that you're part of something, especially during this time of isolation. When all of us are little bitty rocks all over the place in our own little houses, reaching out to the rest of the world through Facebook and text message and phone, that the world is still trying to creep in through technology to still try to unravel the revelation that Peter has as to who Jesus is. You kind of have your moment, even in isolation, to say, no, 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 I know. I know who Jesus is. 
God has revealed Jesus to me, and here's who I see him to be. This revelation to Peter, this revelation to all of us, knowing that we are not the same people that we were yesterday. During this season, we have this opportunity to see Jesus in a new way. That if we have questions of faith that we are still wrestling with, things that we don't really fully understand, we can use this time. Use this time to kind of find out what God wants to reveal to you about who Jesus is. So that you too can have your very own moment where you profess You confess with all your heart, hey, I know who Jesus is. He's the Messiah. He conquered death on the cross for me. And I see Jesus in a new and different way. Not the way I saw him yesterday. Today, I see something a little bit different. I, too, am now Peter. I, too, am now that rock, that stone that makes us the church to help us to teach others to help unlock that gate to the kingdom of heaven to those of us who are still knocking who are trying to figure those things out that we get to be the people who help unlock that door to loosen those locks teaching people Helping people understand what forgiveness is, what reconciliation is. Giving us the kingdom keys so that we can open the door to the next guy and say, here's how you get in. Simon made a confession about who Jesus is and so can you. That opportunity to have tomorrow be marked different. To have your very own Peter Revelation moment is waiting for you. You can sit back and the world can teach you and show you what it wants to show you. And it's not going to encourage you. It's not going to help you grow. It's going to help you to get your heart a little harder, to be that much more bitter, to get that much more fired up about what so-and-so posted, what they had to say, to get yourself that much more polarized. But instead, you can use this time and be marked different by saying, no, I don't see it that way. This is how I see it. See, I don't see Jesus Christ as just this really good guy, this really neat teacher who wrote some really neat books. But instead, I live my life knowing that Jesus is the Messiah. That the Old Testament said that this guy was going to come who was going to help solve this problem of sin. And oh yeah, even bigger than that, that on this Easter Sunday after they tried to kill him on Friday, that he conquered death. And if I believe in him, there's something better planned for me that this world is never going to give me. That I can be part of something bigger. In these moments of isolation, you can be that light that living stone that maybe somebody else needs to hear from. If somebody else is following down the the downward spiral of negativity or the downward spiral of isolation, where they're just kind of going and reading the things they want to read and see the things they want to see to make their little echo chamber that much smaller, that maybe your Simon to Peter moment is to jump in and say, this is how I see Christ. This is who he is for me today in 2020. And I live my life because of this. And you can too. You can be part of this. And your world gets a little bit bigger and their world gets a little bit bigger. Because ministry, regardless of where we are in this sense of isolation, that we are better together. That as Jesus is calling Peter the rock in which he's going to build the church, that Peter isn't the only one. He was never supposed to be the only one. He was the first. We get to add our part. We get to bring our gifts. We get to learn from what other people 
gets seen, what they, God reveals to them that they share to us makes it all a little bit bigger, a little bit better, a little bit brighter. When we start collecting these living stones and putting them together, suddenly the darkness isn't going to be able to stand and becomes this creative light that brings other people in. So that's the key part of this Simon to Peter journey. God showed Simon something. And when he professed it, things changed. God is showing you something. And as you tell others about it, things will keep changing. So that's your part. Be the living stone storytellers that you are called to be. Share your stories. Amen.
learn today about Simon, how he became Peter, how he became the rock with a story to share. So now that the service is over, now becomes that much more your time. You've heard the word proclaimed, the Lord has revealed something to you, and now you have to take what you've been shown and show it to someone else. That time starts right now. That time for you to be the storyteller starts as soon as this is over. Pick up that phone. Send out that text. Maybe there's somebody who you need to share the good news with. So do it now. Go and share. Go and tell. Go in the name of the Father. Go in the name of the Son. And go by the power of the Holy Spirit. And as one church we say, amen. Greetings, High Park Press. Now you got to let me get all the way through it. Greetings, High Park. Greetings, High Park Press. You got to get on the press. Greetings, Hyde Park Press. Greetings, Hyde Park Press.